Hey, everybody. Welcome back once again to Inside the Matrix. We're so happy that you're with us today, and we hope that all of you are doing well out there. Today, I have a very special guest, uh, a gentleman who's done an incredible amount of research about so many topics. And uh, I really wanted to share a lot of his information with you. And uh, I'm going to, some of you will already be familiar with, with Jason Brashears, uh, but here he is. Jason, welcome to the show. Hey, Jimmy. I'm glad to be here. And uh, I think it's the first time I'm first time I've ever talked to your family. Yeah, that's right. And uh, I, I know a lot of them are going to be looking forward to this because uh, some of them, I'm sure, follow you already, but other people may not have heard of you. And I wanted to make them aware of your research and the incredible information that you're putting out there. Um, where would you like to start? Because you're you're. Research is so diverse and it, it goes uh, in so many different directions. Um, I'll just leave it to you where you want to start with this. Um, I guess we can start with that. And okay. so <clears throat> we live, you know, that we live in this, you know, technologically advanced, sophisticated world where things are handed to us, where information comes at the touch of a keyboard, where we think that by Googling information that we're getting a really good, accurate source of material, but it has been my experience that we were actually being fed the very data that they want us to know. And what I mean is, is that basic history is deception by omission. And this came, this came by long, um, basically contact with very old materials. You know, I, I was in prison for a very long time and I decided to do something with that time other than play dominoes and play sports and handball and, and get into stupid stuff. I, I actually applied myself and I, I noticed early on that prisoners like to hold on to old books and they're passed down and guys do 15, 20, 25 years in prison. And some of the books they have have great value and, and hundreds of guys have read them. And before they leave, they don't take their books with them. They pass them on to the next guys. And, and one thing I noticed was the wealth of material that was accessible to me. I, I would have never been able to come in contact with this had I stayed free. In prison, I ended up garnering an education that far exceeds anything that I would have ever, ever been able to do. And it wasn't just old books. It was high quality materials. And by virtue of not having access to a fluid amount of literature, meaning it was static, it's whatever people had on the cell block or whatever I could find in the library. So I would, uh, I often read books that I thought I wouldn't find any value in long, boring, you know, three to 700 page monologues in physics and anthropology. And, 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 and I just, I found amazing data in these, uh, in these really boring books uh, that I was basically forced to read by, by virtue of being bored, bored, nothing else to read at that time. But it's, it's, it's come as a shock to a lot of people how fast my YouTube channel has grown and all that. But, but these people don't take into consideration that I've been in publishing since 2006. I had four books published before I was ever released from prison. I've been in the research game for a very long time, producing you know thousands of data points and, and constructing data sets for people to look and judge for themselves the things that I have found. And uh, I like to show these things visually. As you know, I've got hundreds and hundreds of charts that I've drawn drawn to show people how these things chronologically all fit together. And it was uh, it was this research in prison that led to a series of discoveries. And some of those discoveries I have covered very, very well on my channel. Others were already covered in my published books. But we do not live in a world that is presented to us today. In the modern world, the Google version of reality is not the reality we live in. We live in a world that is constantly reset, and there are very clever edits and adaptations to the programming. These social political conditions are, su are suddenly flipped on end and, and changed. Whole human populations are displaced, sometimes vanish. Whole cities are found completely empty and then later repopula repopulated. We're talking about the enigmas of orphan chains, resets, mud floods, whole civilizations that have been documented in old books for which we can't find a trace on Google today. I says, these are the things that I, I, I have uncovered it sh to show that not only is our reality being edited as we live it, like in the form of Mandela effects, but it's been, there's, there's a pulse 
there is a rhythm to these ways that is measurable, and I call it the Phoenix Phenomenon. It is something that occurs to our world every 138 years, which is just long enough to ensure that no human will ever live through two of them. So it's, it's, it's baffling, it's unusual, and, and, and initially it comes with a lot of resistance. A lot of people say, oh, it's crazy because they're, they're looking at my they're looking at my 81st or my 85th or my 96th video on the Phoenix phenomenon. And they think that that one video covers the whole and then they get lost in a rabbit hole when they go find the playlist and they see there's there's this many videos on this one phenomenon. They start from the beginning. And they go, wow, this totally, totally rocks their boat. And, 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 and they realize that there's substance to this. This is why so many people have gravitated to my channel. I got, I've got a lot of fact checkers. I've got a lot of people that are always downloading the PDFs of the books that I talk about. And many people order the very books that I have read because my bibliography has been made public. 1,300 nonfiction reference books. I have in a PDF that anybody can go to Podium and download for free. I have, I have read and researched and data mined those books and I'm able to discourse about all of them, but I haven't mm -hmm. stopped. I haven't stopped. My library is growing, not just my PDF library of old books, but but my actual library of books from the uh, from 1801 all the way to about 1912. I have a massive collection of actual book hardback books. And uh, I do a lot of videos out of those books and I show people how the information in these books is very different than what is being taught today. Oh yeah, and you know we. I think a lot of us realize that we're in a realm, or in, <laughs> and the the whole spinning ball uh, paradigm that's you know great, the Big Bang and all this crap that we've been you know oh, taught crap. all of our lives. It's all bullshit. And uh, what's fascinating to me, there's there's so many things, but the fact that there is a lot of repeating cycles, and the cycles are exact. There, and you've shown that throughout history, that these cycles repeat. But I want to throw something else out there because, you know, whenever you start putting things out like this, you'll get the naysayers and you'll get people and some people will try and discredit you just because you you were in prison and that you made some mistakes early on in life that I'm sure, you know, you probably think maybe, you know, you could have done something different. But everybody's life, you know, things happen for a reason. And we all have to, uh, you know, recognize that and uh you know, as it says in the Bible, uh, let he who is without sin cast the first stone, right? So I agree. Uh, and, and I think that's important. I, I had really wanted to get that out there because I've seen people say things like that. And, and I think that's just uh, uncalled for. Oh, um, you know what? It's it, listen, it's it's going to be cognitive dissonance. People come to contact with new information for which they have not been prepared for, which their entire life has not even prepared, prepared them to even experience the paradigm shift necessary uh, for them to wrap their mind around such a concept because it's, it's, it's not taught. Nothing, nothing about the archaics output is, is taught from a young age all the way till now. This is a totally novel way of looking at, at uh, basically the human experience. So. This uh, this repetitive timeline is so well documented. It's just I've got I've openly challenged communities and and uh, individual authors. Hey man, listen, all you got to do is write a thesis why you think the the Phoenix phenomenon is untrue, which is going to require them to read three published books, over two hundred articles, and watch eighty one videos <laughs> in, in, in order to do that. But I'm not. I'm not worried about the challenges. There's too much data. I'm overwhelmed with data. And I still can't even get it all out. There's only so many hours in a day, so. I'm um I don't worry about the attacks because I know where they're coming from. I understand you hit that wall, you can't wrap your mind around it. So it's easier to say, well, you're just a, you're just a felon, you're just an ex-convict, you know. So it's so easy, but you know, my own community is uh they will admit, you'll see it in my comment sections a lot from a lot, a lot of my videos. Many people have come to archaics and left, and then something just ate at them and they came back and they started absorbing it and they get it. But initially, the initially my conclusions were not were not what they are today. And what I mean is, is simulation theory was not on my map. Uh, the the old Vedic the old Vedic concepts that bled into Hinduism and Buddhism of the Maya the the world is an illusion the old Gnostic concepts that this is a construct of the demiurge none of these were on my radar none of them when I was putting together 
my whole thesis in prison. And I wrote a book called Chronicon, which is over 500 pages showing basically the entire history of the world in cycles and epicycles that can be shown with a calculator. Irrefutable evidence that we are in a construct, some type of some type of layering of programs and protocols that are unfolding and with such precision that they have predictive value. So when I when I put this put this thesis together before I even got out of prison, I had a I had still not even entertained simulation theory. It wasn't even on it wasn't something to even think about. I was I was thinking from the Judeo Christian mindset that I was raised in, I was really thinking more along the lines of of the oversoul, God the creator being in absolute control of everything. But the more the more I research and the more I just do these logic trains. I do logic trains on my own channel so people can follow me from the beginning of the video where we set a premise and then we follow it all the way through. I'll give you an example of a logic train real, real quick. Um, because of its frequency, the majority of people who actually listen to the evidence will agree that Mandela effect is a real thing. So that's a data point. A second data point would be that it can generally be agreed by all that no one can think of a single Mandela effect that actually hurts us or harms us. Therefore, here's two data points. They form a line. These two data points will automatically lead to the conclusion that, well, if Mandela effects are real, and there's these edits to our reality that we all agree are always affecting the things that are very popular in pop culture and movies that everybody would have remembered. They're not little minor things that only some people remember. It's almost across the board. Everybody remember this. So, right, because we wouldn't even notice it if it was something Yeah, like that. exactly. So, so if Mandela effects are, are real, and if they do not harm us or hurt us in any way, and they're always slight changes and things that were that that the um, the majority of us would have been we would have been privy to you know popular movies and, and cinema all that stuff then we can only conclude that this must be a type of communication and if it's a type of communication then it means it has to be coming from a good or a positive place or mandela effects would also harm us imagine a mandela effect where you just saw the light was green. Now it's time for traffic to continue. Halfway through across the intersection, all of a sudden it goes red again. You got Mandela. It never was green. There's a million ways to do harmful Mandela effects that would create absolute chaos across the board. Sure. Oh, we don't get those. Yeah, like coming up to a bridge and all of a sudden the bridge is gone. <laughs> yeah, we don't get those. We don't get them. So yeah. I have to conclude that Mandela effect is a type of communication from a benefactor. And I have to further conclude, which is my logic train, that if it's not, that they're not designed to harm me and they're designed yet to get my attention, then that means the only message I could infer is that somebody on the outside of the construct is looking in, trying to tell us on the inside, wake the F up. <laughs> so now. The ultimate question, you know, or maybe not the ultimate, but one of the major questions that we all come up against, and we talk about in little my show, Inside the Matrix, you know, we, we pretty much admit that we are in some type of a, uh, a simulated construct, a realm that we're in. But who's running this realm? Who designed this realm? Where did it come from? All those questions come up. I, uh, I, I do address those on my channel frequently. It's uh, one we can only judge a, we can only judge the construct by the very perimeters of the phenomena that we experience within it let me give you an example this is a predator versus prey ecosphere the programming here is for the strong to devour the weak not only on a psychological level but also in the physical in the animal kingdoms so we have we have the spider catches its prey it, it, is, it inserts the venom to neutralize neurotoxins neutralize the victim the victim gets eaten alive so when, when you really really study nature you study you study the the, the effects of a great white shark and how it can tear its prey apart how, how it tears humans apart this this architecture of violence 
that's that's all within the programming. The 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 way the programming accelerates those who seem to be immoral and do not have all the all the underpinnings of some type of ethics that governs their their activities. They seem to excel and do very good. We're seeing so, that big time today. So what I have to agree to is like a passage in the New Testament that says Satan is the god of this world. Now, I'm not a religionist, but I understand that sentiment. I understand that there's a recognition in this Christian passage of the Gnostic belief that the Demiurge was over a construct and that the Archons were helping rule this construct and that it, it, it in itself is a prison. So if that is the case and this construct is actually artificial, then I would have to make the assumption that it must mean that I, and by extension humanity, must be so powerful that it that, that we must be so powerful that on the outside of the construct, it took us to agree to do something on the inside and then imprison us to the point where we actually believe this is the real world when it's not. It's just a copy. Uh, I call it the simulacrum, which comes from the old Latin simulacrum, but this simulacrum is an artificial world. It is a copy of a real world that is somewhere else. And I am firmly uh, of the belief that we humans are on the outside of this construct as well. And uh, I, I do not believe in ancient aliens theory. I used to follow it. I used to read Sitchin and Von Daniken and all that, but the more the more I go deeper and deeper into the phenomena of the past and what was recorded, I see deceit. I see something in the construct wants us to believe in aliens, UFOs, extraterrestrials, and all that. But all this stuff is actually coming from beneath us by another race that is also trapped inside this construct. And it, it's a race that, that, I think there's a lot of information about throughout the traditions and lore of a, of a lot of our uh, of uh, older belief systems, a fallen race, a, ra a race that has done everything in its power to make sure humanity remains absolutely blind to who they actually are as they're passing through the construct, because that's what this is. It's, a, it's another tenet of the archaic, archaic's output. I'm always telling people we are not here to save the world. I said we were here to pass through it as pilgrims. We're sojourners. This is an experience and we're here to accrue all the things that we need, like maturity, experience, by virtue of imagination, empathy, and intuition. And, and when, we, when it's time for us to exit the construct, we take all the benefits with us, but we leave all that other stuff behind. Because sort, of like, uh, sort of like God school. <laughs> yeah, it's like a God school. Well, I'm, hey, 100%. That's what I say in our cakes all the time. We are immortal beings and we're just passing through here. And the greatest, the greatest harm that a highly individualized soul can do is start believing and acting on the idea that they can save the world, which is an artificial construct and is designed for evil to excel. You can't save this. You're only here to pass through it. And to become better and move on to the next to the next level of, of spiritual development, wherever we're going. But, but this is I, this is one I of really think it, I think it behooves us though to to point out the crap as we're as we're going through here. Absolutely, absolutely. There's a there's a huge difference in objectively understanding the 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 wickedness around us and navigating through it and helping people get uh, bypass it and all that. And, and, and that is necessary, but what I'm, what I'm talking about are those who get, who go fall into deep spouts of depression. Cause I know these people, they fall in, into these repetitive uh, depressions because they'll spend 10 years of their life doing things they think will change the world. And then the next 10 years, they're regretting all the time they lost because they realized they didn't affect it at all. There are many <laughs> philosophers who have said over and over that this world this, when you die and leave this world, it will be just as evil as the day you entered it. And, and they knew. I mean, uh, the the older books they knew. They knew that this. They knew that we were sojourners and pilgrims, and uh, they knew that this construct was an artificial world. And they knew that the ultimate destination was, was escape from the construct. And this is why a lot of the older religious systems have these these amazing stories of exodus uh, of, of pilgrimages. Uh, this is why Jesus even spoke in parables, which are which is are which are not the truth. 
Parables are images of truth. And one of the most important parables was the prodigal son. It sure. basically epitomizes exactly what our experience is inside the construct. Because it shows the two different types of, of elect immortal beings. One type is the one that knows what it's supposed to do and and basically follows directions and doesn't do anything to upset the the oversoul doesn't do anything to rock the boat but the oversoul is all about the acquisition of experiences not blind obedience blind obedience is for the slave the oversoul exactly. the prodigal son story is really about the one who rebelled he spent all his dad's money he went out there and hoard around he made all the wrong mistakes he tripped down fell down got beat up dirty didn't know what to do and finally came back home and when he came back home and realized that dad was right from the beginning there was a huge banquet not for the son that never left the party and banquet and celebration was for the one who went out and experienced all those things only to come back with real knowledge mm -hmm. so that's what that i mean that, that whole parable epitomizes exactly what you and i are doing here it's that's exactly oh yeah that's we're perfect. here to fall down go fall down get beat up discover things find out we only know half truths move Do to stupid stuff and then exactly. learn from it yeah. I, I mean it is my position that these these constructs this isn't the only one i believe that these constructs are set up as uh, they're basically to quarantine and to to uh, make sure there's no cross contamination with the outside real universe. That's why all these things are allowed in here. True immortals would never really grow if they never were allowed to experience what it was like not to be immortal. So in order to shed that immortality for a temporal experience that absolutely fools them into believing they have to fear death, these little constructs are, are what are provided. And like I said, I, I, I believe firmly this is only one of them. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about the cycles now, because this is, I find this absolutely fascinating. And it fits right into what you're saying about how you know, we think we're going to change the world or we set out to do that or we find groups that are trying to do the change the world. But these cycles, uh, you know, kind of prove that that's that's a futile uh, attempt to make and right. that uh, right. no matter what we do, we're going to experience these cycles. We're going to go through these cycles, the Phoenix phenomenon and all these other things. And uh, let's also touch about uh, the vapor canopy and, and you know, kind of. Maybe the best way to do this is go, let's go back on your timeline. Sure. Let's go back to the, what you consider the beginning and why, and let's just move it forward and then talk about the, the cycles and what happened. Sure. Um, going in 1947 and 48, the Gnostic Nag Hammadi library was revealed to the world. And one of the texts in there was called the Gnostic Protenoi and on the origin of the world. And in these Gnostic texts, there is a reference that the phoenix is like the is uh, the doom shape, and the phoenix was created from the beginning to keep the archons in check, and that the phoenix disrupted the the rule of the thrones when it first appeared, but uh, it was to keep the calendar. So, uh, this was a late discovery of mine, way after I had almost finished my my phoenix research. But in the ancient world. There was nothing more devastating and hoped for at the same time than the Phoenix. The Phoenix is a very old tradition. As a matter of fact, most Google searches of the Phoenix only pull up the, the Greek and Roman references, which is very late in the antiquity of the Phoenix phenomenon. By that time, the Phoenix cycles, the massive destruction cycles were over. And uh, this is this. So basically what we have is this is. We have references in many, many ancient texts that the Thunderbird or the Phoenix or the Rock initiated the Great Flood. And I show by different chronographers how to date the Great Flood precisely because it's another it's another teaching in archaics that if something is true, it, it can be shown from multiple different mathematical perspectives. So there isn't a, there isn't a single date that I will provide one source. I provide many for all of them. And the Great Flood is one of the things we, we literally have like 17 or 18 different sources and they all basically hone in on the month of May 
for the year 2239 BC as an event that only later was referred to as the Great Flood by Babylonian uh, uh, scribes, which were later copied by Jewish scribes. But the, the original event was the day the sky fell. And this is what it was widely known as. It was the collapse of the vapor canopy. When the vapor canopy collapsed, it literally rained for like a month and a half just to get all, just to drain the mesosphere from all that water. So the world before the flood was not like the world of today. The world of today introduced something new. According to the Egyptians and the Sumerians, they said that they said the sun was born, which is exactly what the ancient American traditions began. The ancient American traditions of the Zapotec, the Toltec, the Quiche, the Aymara, they begin their calendars with the first appearance of the sun after the period called the Dark Midnight. The Dark Midnight was a vapor canopy world. I have like eight videos on vapor canopy, and, and my next video is about it as well. I'm about to release another video on my channel about the Akambaro discoveries, 33,000 figurines showing vapor canopy creatures and humans living together. It's, a, it's, a, it's amazing stuff they found in Mexico in 1944, and it's widely been suppressed. But, to sort of visualize that, in other words, back in when the vapor canopy was here, we didn't have a sun that we could see up in the sky. And I'm assuming it was a much less light uh, in the world. OK, let like, me explain. Let me explain a vapor canopy so everybody's on the same page. Good. Because, um, <clears throat> in astronomy, astronomers believe that Venus today has a vapor canopy. And this is an atmosphere with, with several several miles thick mesosphere. These are water droplets suspended in the atmosphere. But at one time, our vapor canopy was so thick that when the sun came up in the morning, you would only see that area of the sky kind of lit up because all the moisture that was in the on the ground would go back up instantly and obscure the sun. The vapor canopy would form every single morning and it would get thicker and thicker and thicker by day. By the time noon came up, you wouldn't even be able to know where the sun was anywhere in the sky. And it got Got thicker and thicker and thicker until the sun was going down. This is it's called the dark purple light in uh, like uh, in uh, North American Indian traditions, or the dark midnight. And when the sun was going down on the other side of the sky, as the sun went down, all of a sudden the moisture would fall. And the Genesis says there was no such thing as rain before the flood. The entire world was watered by a dew or a mist. This was the collapse of the vapor canopy every evening. As the sun was going down over here on the other side, the canopy would already be collapsing and everybody could see the stars and the moon, but they were magnified because of all the water droplets that stayed suspended in the mesosphere. So it was a giant magnifying glass at night that made the stars so close that it looked like you could climb up to hills and touch them. And this is why a lot of the older star charts have stars that cannot be seen with the naked eye today, but they're oh, clearly yeah. marked. They're clearly it makes perfect marked. sense because, uh, you know, you, you have to wonder it, it, back in ancient times, if they didn't have telescopes and things, how in the heck did they map out all these stars? Yeah, there, there are constellations where the ancients knew of stars that cannot be seen with the naked eye today, but they're there. So this, this mesosphere magnified the heavens every night. And this is why the lunar matriarchal ba matriarchal cultures were at their ascendancy before the flood. This is why the uh, uh, Sumerian the Sumerian pantheon began with a female. Uh, only later patriarchal cultures after the collapse of the vapor canopy, when the patriarchies took over and, and introduced war and all these things that were never done before the during the vapor canopy world humans had things to worry about they didn't have time to worry about wars and fighting each other they had they had giant insects to worry about giant reptiles giant amphibians even today in the tropics we we found boa constrictors at 40 feet long so imagine a vapor canopy world where the atmospheric pressure is different the oxygen content is way way better than it is today it's to the point where mammoths and mastodons could could easily breathe and not tax themselves the oxygen was so rich because under a vapor canopy the plants grew to astonishing sizes because of the dark purple light, not direct sunlight. It was the dark light and the ambient radiation from 
volcanoes. Remember, we have a lot of Hollywood's always hinting at at these things like the show called Land of the Lost in the 70s. Do you remember mm -hmm. that? Yeah. So always got volcanoes uh, venting, out, outflowing. Well, this is the world of the pre during the pre-flood world. We had we had high amounts of volcanism, not eruptions, not explosions. We're talking about gassing out and venting. And we know from 1902, which was a Phoenix year, when, when Mount Pele exploded and killed 35,000 people in a minute on uh, Martinique in the French Caribbean. <coughs> Excuse me. We know that Two scientists who who went there to study the after effects of the uh, uh, of the volcanic uh, detonation on Martinique. We know from Charles Fort's writings in 1919, Book of the Damned, and, and in Low, we find out that those scientists both grew two inches being exposed to that ambient radiation. Now you right. can imagine these men were 58 and 62 or 63 years old. So you can imagine a 1,656 year period where this ambient radiation increased oxygen and this flora and fauna is growing. We're talking about mushrooms 14 feet tall. We're talking so about sort of like I'm thinking about Avatar. Feet. I'm thinking about the movie Avatar with well, giant you know trees. And, There's always truth in fiction. And, so, and okay, here's the other question. Now, um, if if all these plants and animals were gigantic, uh, what about humans? Were were they, uh, you know, the, were they the giants of old? One hundred percent. Listen, uh, on my on my channel, I have disturbed people because I, I basically told them, listen, guys, the Babylonian version, the Enochian version, the Judaic version was all written over a thousand years after the collapse of the vapor canopy. And they were theorizing as to how they had gigantic skeletons, titans and giants mixed with human skeletons. They didn't know. So they created these versions of angels coming down and having sex with human women. And to them, that was acceptable. That's how giants got here. But Makes in, no the sense. <laughs> in the archaics data, I show that the titans were just humans of ordinary size during the vapor canopy world. In the old Greek uh, historians like Hesiod, he's very clear. He goes to describe the titans, the giants, and the regular humans, and it's very clear what happened. Ordinary humans were titanic, just like the saber-toothed tigers, just like all these gigantic uh, uh, creatures. But we have a problem. With the collapse of the vapor canopy, many of those humans couldn't breathe anymore. It takes a lot of oxygen for a larger body. They die out within months. They're struggling for breath for a long time. Those who survive, those who survive and have offspring, and those women who are already pregnant when the canopy was up, when they have their when they had their children, we're talking about you gotta understand, we're talking about thousands and thousands of people survived the collapse of the vapor canopy. And there were people on arcs, there were people hiding in underground facilities, and there were people on the surface who survived. These gigantic people were still living after the collapse of the vapor canopy, but they were all slow moving and they weren't a threat because they couldn't breathe a lot, but they were considered the grandfathers. They were considered the Lugalum. In Sumer, they were Lugal, and they, we see pictures of them. And Lugal just means the big men. And these are, they're on Sumerian reliefs a lot. They're called the Lugalum. Well, the, Lu, the Lugalum, these, these giant titanic people, they're still having children. For those women who were born during, um, for those who got pregnant during the vapor canopy, their offspring became gigantic after, but they weren't titans. They weren't big as the titans, but they were giants. Then when the giants, after the collapse of the vapor canopy, started copulating and, and, and having sons and daughters, their sons and daughters were slightly smaller. This is where you get the near reeds and the, and the demi giants and stuff like that. You get all the daughters of all these famous titans and, and giants. Then the next generation, which is still within 120 years, is having ordinary sized people like you and I. So what we have in the same century are titans who are still alive. Noah of, of Shurapak. Uh, we have giants, the sons of Noah. We have, uh, we're the grandsons of Noah. Uh, one of them mentioned in the Old Testament named Anak. Anak was the grandson of Noah, and Anak in the Old Testament is 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 said to be the the father of the Anakim giants. He was the son son of Noah's son named Arba. But 
Uh, we have titans all within a century of the of the cataclysm, all within a century of the collapse of the vapor canopy or the great flood event. We have titans that are still alive who are venerated, and we have giants in the hundreds of thousands, and we have ordinary humans in the hundreds of thousands. So we have all three at one time, and this in this world is is is, is the world of old Greek myth mythology, old Indian mythology, old Sumerian mythology. This period of time was very short. It only lasted for about 250 years before uh, Sargon of Akkad. Because Sargon of Akkad wanted to clean things up. He himself was of Titan brood. He was he was the offspring of a Titanus, and uh, uh, his father was a giant. So he was huge, bigger than all the ordinary humans. But his first his first thing he did is he went out on a Titan and giant killing spree. He wanted to get rid of all the all the. Uh, competition. And this is what the wars of Sargon are about. When Sargon of Akkad, when he went to take over Babylonia and Assyria and, and Kauna and Zeboim, mean, he just went everywhere. So um, the vapor canopy 100% explains all these anomalies from the historical and the mythological traditions and makes sense and puts them in their proper perspective. It even gives us an exact chronology to go by. We have ancient historians that say that the world is destroyed every 1656 years, which is 138 times 12. But this 160, this 1656 years was the Great Flood, the 1656 year. So that makes year one to be 3895 BC in the month of May. And again, other chronological records point exactly at 3895 BC as being a terrible cataclysm that has come to be known as the Adam and Eve reset, because the whole Adam and Eve story isn't what we were told in Judeo-Christian Bible studies and all that. The whole Adam and, Eve, Adam and Eve story, when you read Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3, critically, you are reading a reset story. Humans are told to be fruitful, replenish, uh, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. Now, but the seven days of the creation aren't a creation at all. They're, they're actually an abbreviated form of the Babylonian Enema Elish, word for word. And it's the Babylonian Enema Elish describes the renovation of our world from a pre previously existing world that was full of cities and people and animals, and it had completely been destroyed. And the Spirit of God hovered over the waters of that destroyed world. And then it began to remake it in seven stages from the bones of Tiamat. Tiamat was something that appeared in the sky and broke into a bunch of pieces and rained all over our world. So with those droppings from another world, a new world was was, was begun, and it was begun for, for the Adamu, which in Babylonian is mankind, but the Jewish... So what were those droppings? And there was actual pieces of the planet or, or, or an okay, asteroid? Uh, or? Okay, before we get into... This is where it gets complex, all right? We're in a construct. Being in a construct, we are actually watching a movie in the sky of what has happened to a real reality somewhere else. Do you follow me? <laughs> this is why I call this experience the nemesis simulation. It's because when we study the Anunanur calendar and we study the Mayan long count and the Olmec, the Olmec long system, when we study the, the Egyptian uh, long chronology and short chronology, we study the Hebrew Jubilees and the ancient Annus Mundi calendar. When we study all these calendars in the, in the Vedic Kali Yuga, the Sumerian king list, and we put them on a chart like you, I, you've probably seen some of my charts where right. I show all these calendars lined up. And it's a perfect mathematical construct, and it shows the year 5239 BC as being the origin of almost every timekeeping system in our world. It's as if the entire history of the world is screaming at us to look at an event that happened in our 5239 BC. Now, what I believe is that because of what these calendars and the messages and the prophecies attached to all these calendars is that that is when the nemesis cataclysm occurred. And when the nemesis cataclysm 
is 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 that we had two suns. Our world, we were able to go outside and see two suns way before the vapor canopy appeared. There was two suns in the sky. One of them was a, a small pinpoint of light that was very bright, and one of them was the yellow sun we have today. And then something happened. The yellow sun actually imploded, folded in on itself. It became what's in physics is called a frozen star. It's not frozen, but it's the gravity well has become so intense that the photons, although they eject, they circle back. They loop back and they can't get away from it. Therefore, there is a very bright, blindingly bright object in the sky that we cannot see. It looks like total blackness out there. And we so was that the black sun that people refer to? We call it the Cygnus Rift. But this area puts off zero light. There's no light whatsoever. It folds back. Now, I believe that everything in the sky is simulated. I believe what it is showing is a program. We are, we are induced to believe these things. On the outside of the construct, we're immortal beings. But there has to be a convincing narrative in order for people to play. <laughs> Do you follow me? Yeah, sure. If if we ha came into this world without amnesia, with our full knowing, there would be no point to any of this. There would be no we wouldn't point. stick around. <laughs> so the construct is sufficiently able to introduce enough complexity that Cerebr cerebrally, we can just uncover mystery after mystery after mystery after mystery after mystery, after mystery build these narratives, uh, and even affect the past of the construct, retrocausality, and modify future events. The construct allows us to do all these things. We are very powerful in the, uh, as individuals. Man, this is... This is also a fundamental tenet of the archaic's output, is that we are existing in two different realities at the same time. One of them belongs to the collective, and it's the construct itself and the narratives and reality tunnels that it, that it propagates for us to flow through, that we experience many of the same things together, day and night, you know, different social conditions. We're, well, we're either Americans or Canadians or Mexicans. We, we have these things that we experience together. but. There's a second reality, and this is the one most people ignore. And this is the co-creator aspect of the divine mortal, immortal, who is finally basically awakened to their identity. And it is the ability to think things into existence, feel that they are real, and move in that direction. And then the construct takes that as a protocol and makes those things happen for that individual, not for the rest of the construct. We build our own realities, reality tunnels all the time. And this is this is this is one of my main messages. I'm always telling I'm, I did a video about it yesterday uh, on my channel. It's this is why so many people can't get past the intellectual barriers. They're still stuck in the in the construct collective thinking, and they're not thinking individually as themselves. All answers to every mysteries are within. We're gonna, you're gonna find them. All you have to do is search for them. The problem is this construct requires that it basically requires a relationship. And what I mean is, is the is if you think that you're personally able to accomplish all the things that you want in life, then that's basically an admission to the construct that you do you don't want to play, you don't want to be in a relationship <laughs> that you think you can do it all, so it leaves you alone. But for those who have faith in the construct's ability to reciprocate. Those individuals know that they don't have to follow through and finish something. They have to, as a co-creator, they initiate it. They imagine it. They put it into the thought field. They project it. They feel as if it, it's coming to pass or it will come to pass. And then, therefore, their physical avatar moves in that direction. And as soon as the physical avatar moves in the direction as if something that is unreal is actually true, it takes that artificiality and it creates its existence. This is what the construct thrives on. It thrives on making new things, and it can only do that through the highly individualized soul. The construct itself, all it does is it's stuck in feedback loops. All it does is, is, is basically control the masses, and it, and it does that to save energy. It does that because it's easy. It's easy to expend a very little amount of energy if you're creating the same holography for 100 million people. 
But if you have a hundred million people who are free thinkers, who are doing what they want to do, moving in all directions, and each one building their own macroverse inside of this universe, that's a problem. Now you have processing power problems. And we've seen this. The, the awakening that is happening right now is the very reason why when you watch the news, nothing makes sense. In the 60s, it made sense when you watched the news. You knew that was some socialist BS, or you knew that was ultra-conservative BS. You knew this was some Democrat BS. You knew this was some religious right BS. You knew. It was easy to ascertain the direction of events. In the 80s, it got a little weirder. In the 90s, it got a little weirder. But right now, it has never been. To the point where people have basically thrown up their arms like nothing makes sense. Everything reported about President Biden is absolutely is every every single event reported would have ended up in an impeachment 30 years ago. No president could have ever done all these things. It's 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 gotten to the point of ridiculousness. These (laughs) all all this transhuman, transgender, all these things that are reported now, it's it's The construct itself is losing its ability because too many people have woke up too fast. And I believe and I believe that this has everything to do with Mandela effect. It has everything to do with something on the outside of the construct trying to get everybody to wake up, because it is my theory that I have promoted a lot on my channel that. As soon as a soul wakes up in the construct, it's your last life sim here. You're no longer in this feedback loop because the construct itself finds you to be a liability now. You're not wanted here anymore. Once you're awakened, you're not wanted here anymore. It's time for you to make your exodus. So that's something I talk about a lot on my channel. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. It really does. And, uh, you know, we like you said, we're pilgrims <laughs> moving through this. And uh, this God school, I like to refer to it as God school. It is. It, 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 it is a good, that's a good description. Of yeah. God school. So but let's that, talk about, uh, if you don't mind, let, your your predictions that you've made recently. And, now the, and these are based on the cycles, right? That we've been through and that you've charted <laughs> out in your diagrams and everything, how these, <clears throat> these cycles repeat themselves over and over and over again. And I think... Right partially the the awakening that you're talking about because we're we're coming up you know pretty soon to the end of one of those cycles so maybe that's that's part of the uh, reason to have those beginnings and endings so that you know we can have minor resets major resets because people get too smart they wake up too much and oh you know we got to push the reset button and and start the game over again i agree I, i i can see it so let me give it to you so so people can understand the gravity of a prediction I'm going to run through the Phoenix phenomenon really fast. Now, for, for anybody who's really interested, I got three published books. I got 81 videos and 200 articles written about this and over 300 charts. But I'm going to give it to you in a narrative very fast. So the very first the very first time the Phoenix appeared and it was almost a total world destruction was 4309 B.C. Wait, Four- can now, now, can we define Phoenix? Because a lot of people, when you say Phoenix, they're going to picture a bird. Right, okay. rising up this, out of the ashes or something. This is the imagery that we've been yes. shown, right? Okay. This is the imagery we've been shown for two reasons. Because mm. Phoenix has two meanings. Remember, we live in two different realities at the same time. And the Phoenix epitomizes the, sim- the symbolism. So for those who are awake, for those who have no fear, for those who are vibrating on a totally different frequency, the phoenix does not search them out. These are the survivors. These are the people who make it. These are the communities that are untouched when a tornado takes the other ones completely out. This is this is the phoenix is the symbol of rebirth, hope, rebuilding, and resurrection. But for the collective, for those who are steeped in fear programming, who do not recognize that they are a highly individualized, immortal soul living in an avatar inside a construct, for those individuals, that's the majority of humanity, it's a destructive reset. It's a collapse of their infrastructures. It's it's volcanic resurfacing. It's a complete change in the biosphere. Oh yeah, the vapor canopy not, has not been the only biosphere that humans have lived under. The reason for such racial diversity, although we're all human and we all have souls, the reason is because we've been forced to live under very different 
biospheric conditions, different types of worlds, which makes sense in the mythological and the mythological in, 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 the, in, the, in the legend traditions and all that. When we break it all down, we, we realize it's the reason why our world is the way it is today. It is scarred with deserts and it has whole tempered jungle areas. And we know and we know we have whole areas that we've built cities on top of seabeds. And our geologists have told us told us how this world has flipped over and over and over. And the deeper we go, we still find human artifacts. This place has been used for this purpose for a very long period of time. Yeah, and, and it's feet, not a spinning ball hurtling through space at millions of miles an hour. Yeah, I agree. 100%. I agree. <laughs> and I mean, check this out. Here's something that no one, I've never heard anybody say on any channel, but, but it's common sense. If we're going 63,000 miles per hour, on an orbit around a star, are we to assume the spirit world also travels at that velocity? Because I know that many people have had have had experiences with spiritual phenomena, with with phantasms, poltergeists, ghosts, even demon uh, demon things. Are things of the spirit also moving at that velocity to keep up with us? Are we to assume that the spirit world's rotating with us? I mean, <laughs> so. you'd have to to buy into that, right? Yeah, yeah, I just can't, I'm just not buying it either. It's a uh, yeah. Oh, there, there's no sense in going into the details, but you already know the testing is that this world does not move. Scientific right. testing shows that we're not we're stationary, we're not moving. Exactly. But the phoenix, the phoenix appears 4309 BC and completely destroys the world. 414 years later, phoenix reappears, and when I say phoenix, it's it's a red star. I need I need to I need to define that. In yeah. most of the in most of the ancient texts, Phoenix first appears as a unknown red star, and that red star gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and then it seems to be on flames like a dust veil, red red rain, red mud, and red dust, depending upon the relative humidity of whatever ge geography is recording the event. But it's red dust, red mud, or red rain that falls all over the world. The moon turns red. The sun goes black, like something's covering over it, but you can still see the sun faintly. The dust veil looks like wings. So this it was given a phoenix effect. Uh, Harold T. Wilkins in the 50s described it the best, but I, I, I quote him a lot too. But anyway, so we have a 414-year period until 3895 BC, the Adam and Eve reset. So then we have a 1656-year period to the Great Flood, the day the sky fell. The vapor canopy collapsed it was 2239 BC. These two, these two, all three of these events are on multiples of 138 years. 414 years is 138 times 3. 1656 years is 138 times 12. Then 276 years after the Great Flood, we have an event uh, in the 20th century BC, which is which is 138 plus 138, when, according to the Ramayana, we have this great, vast darkness covers the sun, there's earthquakes, thunderbolts hit the sky, uh, um, we have this great destruction that happened over Pakistan, Mohenjo-Dara, India, all that area like that. So we move, we move forward through time to, to a year known as 1687 BC, the Ogaijian Deluge. I literally have seven or eight videos about this one event, and I still haven't covered it totally. But there are many, many different ancient sources that all talk about this event, the Ogaijian Deluge. And it's it's said in some ancient sources to have been the year, uh, I can't remember, whatever it was, it was in the Annus Mundi, in the Annus Mundi dating, uh, I want to say, I can't, 22, that's right, 2208. Anyway, they're in the Ogaijian deluge happened according to ancient historians in the year 2208. But in our calendar, it's 1687 BC, but they're the same year. And the reason we know this is 2208 is divisible by 138, and it's 2,208 years from the Adam and Eve reset. It's a part, these are calendars going forward and backward in time, but they intersect right there. On this event, the Ogaijian Deluge. This was a flood event over the Mediterranean, Egypt, and all that, 552 years after the Great Flood, which is 138 times four. So it wasn't a vapor canopy flood. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. A, but, but no, it wasn't a vapor canopy flooding. It's a regional flooding just for the Mediterranean area. 
destroyed Greece. It destroyed uh, Egypt. It may have done. It may have done some damage in the in the, in the Americas. But W. J. Perry in 1923 published a book called Children of the Sun. His book is over 500 pages. The entire thesis is about is about every Bronze Age dynasty in the world collapsed at about. 1688 BC. He was one year off, but it's a scientific bullseye because he said about. He didn't say it was the year 1688. He got the Phoenix phenomenon. It's 16, it was the month of May 1687. So Harold T. Wilkins, Marcus Varro, many people explain uh, the Hittite records. They all explain this great object appeared in the sky, caused the Ogaijin deluge. But 138 years later, something else appeared in the sky. The Egyptians saw the sky go dark in the Cyclades region. Uh, it's all the, not, not Cyclades. It's, the Cyclades is a, is a bunch of uh, islands, but they were completely obliterated, according to a historian named Castleden, in the year 1549 BC, which is exactly 138 years later. And then, precisely 138 years after that, we have a tray use at the Lion's Gate predicting that the sun is going to go dark. This is the second time the Phoenix phenomenon was, act well, this is the third time the Phoenix phenomenon was accurately predicted. The first time it was predicted in, by, sh by, 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 you know him, you know of him as Noah, but the actual person was was Anapishtim of the Sumerian city of Shurapak. In the Bible, his name is Noah. He predicted the great flood was going to happen in 120 years. In Genesis, it, it says that God basically told him in 120 years the great flood was going to occur and 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 to build a boat and all this stuff. So um, uh, we have this as a prediction of this event, but in in 1687 BC, we have Jacob in the book of Jasher. He is praying to God uh, to deliver his sons from the Canaanites after the rape of Dinah. The Israelite, the Israelite brothers, their their sister named Dinah had been violated by the men of Shisham. So they came together and they butchered the house of Shisham. Then seven Canaanite armies surrounded them, but it was just Jacob and his 11 sons with uh, their families. It wasn't a, It wasn't the Israelite nation yet. This was way before that. This is way before they went to Egypt. So there in the, in the book of Jasher, the story is told that, that Jacob prayed and he was told by the spirit man that deliverance was coming and all that. And then all of a sudden the sun darkened. And in, in, in the Jasher text that says a worldwide quake that the, uh, for which the, that, the world had never experienced before happened. Then stones fell from the sky. Six, this was this was precisely according to biblical chronologist Stephen Jones. It was precisely the year 1687 BC. He dated that himself and doesn't know anything about the Phoenix phenomenon. So <clears throat> he used the Book of Jubilees, Assyrian eponyms, and the Book of Jasher to come up with that date for that destruction. So. Uh, it was predicted again by, by the house of Atreus. Uh, Atreus and his brother were vying, were vying over the throne of Argos. And the people of Argos uh, were going to choose his brother because he was, a, he was a good warrior, a fighter, and all that. But Atreus told them that the sun was going to darken and that there would be a disaster on a certain date. And it happened exactly like that. And this, again, was... Uh, this was 1273 BC. This is on the Phoenix timelines, 138 years after 1549, well, the historian, the Castleton historian event in the Cyclades. So it happened and he was made king because he had predicted it. But the Hittite records of the time, uh, Hattie records, also say that by unknown means, the sun became obscured. And I'm just glossing over. I actually have a whole lot more records than all these. Sure. I'm just trying, I'm just trying to, uh, hit the highlights. So 138 years after that, we have the Great Mediterranean Dark Age. It is a reset that lasted 400 years. In 1135, in 1135 BC, the the uh, the entire area of the Mediterranean was laid waste in in a darkness descended across the sky, uh, tsunamis, earthquakes. Yeah, it was terrible. And these lightning blasts, like flux tube activity and stuff, thunderbolts, uh, hit all these fortifications and vitrified them. Hittite Empire collapsed. Mycenae collapsed. Uh, um, 
and, and the fleets of the Danan at the time had just left and went to the shores of Ireland about, about 10 years earlier. And in that 10 years, they fought for control of Ireland and they were doing bad. And in the 10th year of this massive campaign against the Firbolgs, which were giants in Ireland, the Tuatha Dé Danann uh, waited, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, the Tuatha Dé Danann waited because their priests had given them instructions, their astronomers, and they waited for the right time. And they all lined up on the ships on the coast. And before they started their assault, all of a sudden the sun darkened, the moon turned red, uh, earthquakes, and, and the sea became restless. And, and the fur bulgs who were on land thought it was the magicians of the Tuatha Dé Danann who was causing that because they had done a ritual with their battle standards. But it wasn't. It was precisely a predicted event. So I have shown in my research that a knowledge of the 138 year periodicity of this phenomenon was known in ancient times. It's the reason why Aztec pyramids have 138 snake heads on, on the pyramids. It's the reason why many of the ancient uh, archaeoastronomical, you know, archaeoastronomical, I can't even say the word right now. Uh, a, lot, a, lot of the, a lot of the monuments, they have 138 niches. They have 138 features. Uh, some of them are 138 units, hunabs tall, you know, in, in a ancient American measurement system. So it's like the Great Pyramid is measured out. I have, I have, I have like 50 videos explaining how the scientific measurements of Sir Flinders Petrie on the Great Pyramid done to the thousands of an inch with a micrometer show that all these measurements are, are, are divisible by 138. And there's I saw that uh, that recent video you did on that, and that was absolutely fascinating. Oh, yeah, that was, a over, that was an overview for about 16 videos that go into a lot of depth. Uh, yeah, this it, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Yeah, the Great Pyramid is, is such a technological marvel. I mean, we can't even fathom you know creating something like that today so let me let, i'm gonna get back to the pyramid in just a second okay so 1135 bc we have this reset 400 years great mediterranean dark age and out of that dark age we have hesiod's theogony we have homer's odyssey we have homer's iliad you know later later on we have all the other major works like lucretius and ovid and and uh, virgil of rome we find we we have these major cosmoses and epics but everything is now rendered into highly mythological tones and it's because the technical sophistication that existed prior to the reset had been lost and this has happened to us many many times people think that the further we go back in time the more primitive we are. And that is not what we have found. We have mm. found the exact opposite to be true because Jimmy, it only takes us 200 years to go from horse and buggy to Hadron collider. And <laughs> if that's true, then I have to apply that truth to the past as well, where mm. I see all these evidence of technological sophistication. Mm -hmm. So this 138 years after 1135 BC, during the Dark Age, we don't have hardly hardly any records. Later on, after the after five, after eleven thirty five BC, it seems to be like a three hundred year period. It's just not a whole lot. And then all of a sudden, we find out somebody had remembered the the Phoenix uh, uh, chronology because Thales of Miletus, according to Her Herodotus of Halicarnassus, Thales was a Phoenician by remote descent. That, that's the key to understanding this because it was the Phoenicians that had all the old maps, all the old libraries, all the old charts. They knew about the Americas. They knew there was no ice. Uh, there was no, no ice on Antarctica. They had mapped out, the Phoenicians had mapped out everything. They knew all the route, routes and they kept these things secret, but they also knew the chronology. And it was the Phoenicians who are interchangeable with ancient Israelites. All throughout the book of Jasher, all throughout the historical record, you will find that the word Israelite is strictly biblical. No nations in the world ever called anybody Israelites. There are no archaeological tablets, texts, cuneiform. There's no demotic, no hieratic. There's no tomb text, no effigies, nothing where you will ever find Israelites were recognized in the historical record as Israelites. They weren't. The actual text called them Bit Umri. And Bit Umri, this is in the Bible too, it's the house of Omri. Omri was officially the first king of Israel. 
So this is in the Old Testament, and it's found in the cuneiform. The Israelites were called Bi'umri, and later it became Qumri and Simri and Sumerians. And I don't mean Sumerians. I'm talking about C-I-M-M-E-R-I-A-N-S. So these, pe these people were known in their geographical area, though, as the people, the, the people of the purple. They were called Phoenicians, and a lot of historians are now coming around realizing, damn, the whole all this time we have separated Israelite from Phoenician, whether the exact same people. So J Jacobites uh, in the Book of Jasher, when that was predicted, that was Phoenician. Uh, uh, Adnapishtim of Shurapak, he's one of the progenitors of, of these people who later were known as Phoenicians. So we have one group, the Danan, who were recognized anciently from Danoi. They were a offshoot of the Phoenician people. So we keep having Argo, the people of Argos were a Phoenician settled people. So these were the ancestors of the Mycenaeans. Mycenaeans were a Phoenician descended people. The Phoenicians sent colonies out everywhere. And the Old Testament shows this. The Old Testament shows that over and over and over, a famine kept striking the Middle East. And every time it happened, waves of Israelite fleets just left and built colonies everywhere. This is what they, had, they were Carthage great sailors, was. right? Yes, great sailors. And then Carthage was the same way. But but Israelite fleets would colonize all these areas and become massive nations and all that. But one, and, and, and it's criticized in the Old Testament, and the criticism is laid at the Danan. The, the tribe of Dan was criticized uh, because uh, they remained in ships. Instead of actually colonizing and becoming a great nation on land, it seemed like that one offshoot just wanted to piracy and just living on their, the whole families lived on the Danan ships. And they would go from, from place all around. They just, they were, they were a vagabond, you know, and they were excommunicated from the family of Israel. They were removed from the Israelite tribe list in the Old Testament. They are restored in the book of Revelation. When you read the same, the, uh, when you read the same list of all the tribes of Israel who receive the blessings of the earth and all that, in the uh, in the tribulation and all that, Dan is restored in the list. But in the Old Testament, they had removed Dan because Dan was not fulfilling the Abrahamic covenant, which was basically to fill the earth. So they were pirates, right? <laughs> <laughs> Basically, they had, that's what they had become. But the Danan, uh, an offshoot of Dan, the Danan made it to the, the shores of Ireland in 1135 BC. It's called the Battle of the Field of Towers, the Battle of Moitura. And this is when they finally, the second battle is when they finally defeated the Firbolgs when the sun darkened. So it was after this in 721 BC. This is interesting because it's a phoenix year. Seven, seven. 21 BC, we have Roman records from Marcus Varro and others that describe a, a anomaly in the sun and something unusual appeared in the sky, but we don't get a lot of details. But interestingly, 721 was the year that the Assyrians deported the last of the Israelites into, into a, a exile. And uh, the, the Israelites were no more. And the only ones that were left behind were the Judeans who hated them. And then the Judeans went in there and took their libraries and rewrote their books and produced what, what's called the Old Testament today. So the uh, this is 721. But in 583 B.C., which is 138 years later, we're still on that 138-year deal. 500, in 583 B.C., we have a major battle. At the end of five years of warfare, the empires of Lydia and Media finally meet, and they're going to have an all-out Armageddon. This is winner takes all. They've been doing skirmishes for five years in different countries, and finally they meet, and one of the people officiating the, the battle is Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. He's there to observe the battle. This is all in the historical record. Right before both armies meet, the sun darkens. And the sun darkens for a long period of time and it spooks them out. It's like, because they know it's not an eclipse. It has nothing to do with the moon. Herodotus mentions three, three eclipses that are done by the moon. But this he describes separately, not in the eclipse section. And he says it was a strange phenomenon, but it was predicted by Thales of Miletus, who was a Phoenician by remote descent. This is 583 BC. This event is commemorated on a statue in Phrygia called uh, Yasilikaya. And it shows the kings of Media and the kings of of uh, 
Lydia actually uh, uh, coming and informing a truce, and in their hands together is a black sun. It's a, this is the symbol. It's called Yasilikaya. Uh, Emmanuel Velikovsky was the one that the, his his material was the one that led me to that. I did not know anything about Yasilikaya, but it was it was it was built to commemorate the sun darkening and stopping the Great War. They actually became allies. Media, media and Lydia became allies behind this event. Wow. So so that was on the 138 year year deal. Then we have 445 BC, massive destruction throughout throughout the Americas. It is recorded. You know what? I got this book right here. Uh the Stones of Time. Here it is. I got books everywhere. <laughs> oh, in this book here, The Stones of Time, this guy has gone through and spent his life deciphering all this all these megaliths and all this all it's just, it's amazing book. But his conclusion is, is that in 445 BC, at least 800,000 people lost their lives in the Mediterranean area because of a disaster from the sky. But he's equally convinced that Libyans escaping that disaster made it to the shores of America because he shows petroglyphs that could have only been done by Libyans who actually had a understanding of, of, of Egyptian forms of communication. It's all, it's amazing. It's a, am, it's amazing research. Well, we have the Egyptians, you know, like, uh, you know, I'm in Vegas here and we have, uh, down in the grand Canyon, we've got all kinds of Egyptian artifacts and an entire, uh, Egyptian, yeah. uh, system down there Ironically, that you're yeah, not allowed to go that, visit. Yeah. You're talking about the Egyptians like nine. Okay. Was it 19, 1909? I believe it was 1909. The, yeah. I have a video about it in the newspaper called the Phoenix Gazette. It shows pictures of the Egyptian artifacts that were found in a cavern in the uh, in the Grand, Grand Canyon. Canyon. Yeah. But the cavern was explored by two scientists from the Smithsonian Institution. And they went in there and mapped it all out. It was it was sensational. And after that, the government shut the facility down. You can't go, you can't go in there. Nope. So in the night in my video, I explained in the 1980s, somebody had decided to call the Smithsonian Institution on their bullshit. And they went into the archives of the Smithsonian Institution and found the two guys that 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 took those pictures. Because since the 1920s, the Smithsonian Institution has been telling all the newspapers that those two men have never worked for us. We right. don't know who they are. Right. But in their own archives, this guy pulled him up and I showed him on my channel where he, he basically showed him that you're a liar. You're a liar. So they really did find these things. If you went to that great effort to, to censor all these files, then that means there's truth to them. But yeah, yeah that's the, uh, yeah, you're right. So anyway, on the 138 years, 445 BC, the next one was uh 330. Oh my God. I can't even remember now. 138 year timeline, 301, 301 BC, which we have one reference, only one, but it comes from the Dutch Oralind manuscript. And then we keep moving, we keep moving closer and closer to a present day on this 138 year timeline. And we come across the Battle of Actium, famous battle involving Queen Cleopatra and Antony. But what's not known about this period was that a great fiery red dragon appeared over Egypt during, during this massive war between civil war. It's a Roman civil war. So the worst earthquake in Jerusalem's entire history was, it happened at the exact same time that over 30 cities were shook in Greece in 31 BC during the battle of Actium, the waters were restless, but this is what happened over the Mediterranean. And it said that the fiery red, the fiery red dragon actually bled uh, tears of blood. So this is the Phoenix phenomenon 31 BC. It's on the 138 year timeline. But what's even more massive is that the level of destruction in the Mayan cities in the Yucatan at that exact date of 31 BC is catastrophic. As a matter of fact, the final date steal for a for a 900 year old civilization called the Olmeca, the final date steal translates from 
from the Mesoamerican calendar into the modern calendar to 31 BC. And I show I show pictures of this date still and all the books that talk about it. It's the final date ever recorded by the Olmecs. It's 31 BC. It's the Phoenix phenomenon totally wiped that civilization out. And the uh, survivors became what we know as the Proto-Maya, Proto -Maya, the Mayans. But um, this was 31 BC. Then we have a couple episodes. We don't have anything for 108 AD. I don't have any records for 108 AD, but I do for the next one. The, the 248 was a 108, and I gotta get my calculator out. 278. I don't know. We have great. We have we have great amount of destruction in 522 AD. It's called the Justinian Reset, the Great Justinian Plagues. Uh, I have a whole video showing how the Roman Catholic Church basically did away with the Phoenix calendar. They admit it in Roman Catholic. I have, I show Roman Catholic records where they did away with the 552 year Phoenix cycle deal because they didn't want anybody to be able to predict these resets anymore. So no, they created they didn't want people they, to be they, ignorant like they are now. <laughs> they created a whole new calendar. You know that calendar because it's the one you live in now. Yep. The Anno Domini calendar did not start when Jesus was born. That's the lie. Anybody who even Googles the Anno Domini calendar, it will be freely admitted on Wikipedia or on Google. You will see that that calendar was started 526 years after the believed date of, of, of Jesus. So that's a calendar that was created in retrospect for a different reason. They just wanted to backdate it to the date that they thought Jesus was born, 2 B.C. So, but, but the real essence is, is that there was no AD calendar for 526 years leading up to that. Then all of a sudden they created one and it's always, it's always been a mystery to a lot of people. Why did you wait till then? Why did Sausagenes design a calendar over five centuries after this event? But and people, oh, people automatically think, well, it's because they became, Europe became more Christianized and all that, but it's not true. It's not true at all. In their own Roman Catholic records, they admit that they had to do away with the Buddhic calendar, which was which was measured in cycles of 552 years, which is 138 times four. And they needed to do away with it quick because in 522, one of those cycles had just ended, and it was it was widely recorded. And I have whole videos about 522, what happened in that year. It was a Phoenix phenomenon year. But uh, before before that, it was 378. Before that, it was 246. And in all those dates, we have British records, Anglo-Saxon records. We have European records of, of, of fiery dragons appearing in the sky. These are all 138 years apart. Then we have a silent period. We know of it as the Dark Ages. But during the Dark Ages, we don't have a whole lot of, of records for the 138 years uh, deal. But what we do have are historians and archaeologists admitting that right around those those years, 660, 798, and uh, 930, right around those years were terrible years for Mayan cities in the Yucatan. Problem is, the Spanish conquistadors came over and burned all their manuscripts. We don't have their chronologies. We don't have, we have no way of verifying what those dates were for those destructions. We just have approximates that were given to us by archaeologists. And I show on my, my channel how those approximates are still very close, but they're not dead on. I'm a chronologist, therefore, I need exact records. Uh, approximations are okay, but I want exact records. But we do have, it does pick back up in 1212. We, we, have, we have some terrifying events that happened in 1212 AD, and one of those is was covered up by the church because all over Europe, hundreds of thousands of children vanished. Now, this this uh, this is more than the normal vanishings that were already occurring. It was so bad, in fact, that whole communities were emptied of their children, and uh, the church had to answer for that. So they came up with a story. It's a cover story. It's not true. It's called the Children's Crusade, and that children got together all over the Europe all of a sudden without any means of telecommunication and decided to come together because adults weren't able to win the crusades against the Muslims to win Jerusalem back for God. So the, the true children of God must be the little kids. So all they all come together, get together, and they march toward the Middle East from which they were never heard from again. We don't know how they got on ships. and got. We don't know any of those details. And the reason we don't know those details is because the story is a lie. 
It was created by the church because its back was against the wall. People, people of all, from the nobility on down, people were demanding answers. What the hell happened? And one of the, one of the trademark trademark things that I have found out about the Phoenix phenomenon is it causes mass human vanishings. It also wow. it also introduces new phenomena. So this is twelve twelve. This is the origin of the Pied Piper of Hamlin stories, where some figure appears playing music, and all the children follow him, and it goes right into a wall, and it's not seen anymore. Uh, so remember, Phoenix is also attached to the idea of Exodus, a departure from the construct for whatever reason. So. Why all these children disappeared, I don't know, but I do know this. Right after 1212, things got really bad in Europe. The bubonic plague, one-third of the entire world's population getting killed. Uh, it got really bad at those times. But we have uh, 1350 A.D. We have a few little records, nothing really important. Oh, 1212 was also like 300,000 people in Norway were washed out to sea. They just woke up one morning and the sea rose. And then they had to climb to the rooftop. Sea kept rising. Climbed the highest hill. Sea kept rising. And then when it left, it left at high velocity and pulled three hundred thousand people out to sea, never seen again. This wow. was uh, tw this is twelve twelve A.D. Uh, as well. So uh, thirteen fifty A.D. We have some phenomena. Then fourteen eighty eight. We have the birth of of Mother Shipton and some and some strange phenomena, but nothing really, no big deal. Um, the big resets are are over with. Then the the, the next big one is the, the one that we know of prophetically as Apocalypse. So we have uh, uh, 1488, we have the birth of Mother Shipton, Ursula Southfield, which is very interesting because she predicted the Phoenix phenomenon with exactitude. Now, her poem has been has been added to by forgers. People have forged material into it called interpolations. They have done this for whatever reasons to, to make it look like events in the 1700s and 1800s come true that they were predicted. Excuse me, but they weren't. Her poem was about the last days. So all the things leading up to it, a lot of that stuff was just forged. But the essence of her original poem was about the coming of the two dragons. And she described that the first dragon would come one century after a world war. So if we take 1940, which is the beginning of World War II, uh, as a, uh, as a, for basically what she's talking about, then 2040 is the target for this dragon. 2040 happens to be the target on the 138 year timeline as well, because 1488 plus 138 years is 1626. And we know that there was massive North American changes in 1626. The maps of the 1580s do not look anything like the maps of the 1630s. Uh, uh, and many people on YouTube have shown these maps. They're, they're major major destructive differences, the disappearance of bodies of water, the, the appearance of Great Lakes, all these things, huge changes in North America during this. Right yeah, and wasn't California shown as an island? California uh, was completely separate. Yeah. yeah. And that body of water is gone. In its place now is Death Valley, and where wooden ships have been found sticking out of the sand. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, local local Indians in the 1930s, Indians would take tourists out way as a two day walk way out in the middle of the of Death Valley and show people here's a whole wooden ship just sitting on top of the sand. So, yeah, it drained out fast. So, uh, yeah, there was a huge change in 1626, which also the 1626 was actually the birth of of uh, New York City. It was when not New York City, but New York period in 1626 is when the Dutch bought. Uh, that whole tract of land from the Manhattan Indians, for which the area was later called Manhattan. But uh, yeah, it's it's the destruction of New York is pretty much encoded within its beginning. That was a Phoenix year. So um, it's just like Nostradamus says, the new city, new city is going to be destroyed. Uh, he even dates it. He's a great, terrible troubling in the month of May. Uh, the new city is destroyed by fire from the sky and all that. Yeah, he's... he's uh, uh, you'd have to go into the to the research of Mario reading to see the date index for Nostradamus, but he actually dated his quatrains. They're just not in the centuries. He wrote private letters to King Henry and to his son Caesar, and uh, other scholars like uh, C uh, like Caesar Ramadi and uh, 
Mario Reading have actually found this date index and applied it, and it's phenomenal. What Nostradamus says about May of 2040 will blow your mind only after you understand the Phoenix phenomenon and how it, and how it appears every 138 years. Like in 1764, half a million people in Europe looked up and something darkened the sun. It wasn't expected. It wasn't the moon. And uh, astronomer Hoffman at the time was studying the sun through a telescope when he saw it and he recorded it in the Royal, in the Royal Astronomical Minutes. Uh, this was 1764, and it was in the month of May. And he saw something that's mentioned in ancient Hittite texts. And that is the object Nin, uh, uh, Ninciana, yeah, Ninciana passes over the sun from the north going south. This is in the Hittite records for the Phoenix year of, uh, of 1687 BC. But astonishing, in 1764, Starmer Hoffman saw that a vast dark object blotted out the sun, traveling from northern space, crossing over the face of the sun, and disappearing in southern space. No objects in our skies move like that. Everything moves on the ecliptic. Everything's on the ecliptic plane. All, right. all the wandering stars that we call planets, the moon and the sun, are all in that 30-degree belt or, 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 or the, called the ecliptic plane. This yeah, object... It's a sky clock. Total, sky clock. Yeah, sky clock. This object went north to south, totally different. Wow. Just like it's on a totally different ecliptic for a different body. So this is what he, and this is why he was so, he was dismissed because he recorded what he saw. He recorded his observations and because nothing was known to pass that way, astronomers of the day just wrote it in the minutes and then lightly dismissed it. Now that was 1764 when there was red dust, red rain, red mud, earthquakes, all kinds of things happening around the world. But 138 years later was 1902. Charles Fort calls 1902 the other dark age, and it's because of all the weird phenomena. I have like six or seven videos now just on 1902. Yeah, that, that's an amazing year. All the weird things that happened in that year do not make sense. As a matter of fact, the events leading up to 1902 are so censored and so covered up by the establishment that, that Carnegie, Rothschild and Rockefeller had to fund over 10,000 new libraries throughout Europe, the Americas, and the UK with all new books from all new publishing houses to give us a new version of history because it doesn't comport with what we have in, in the older books. This is this is what they did. Anybody can Google. Anybody can Google yeah. uh, all the libraries that were suddenly funded in 1901, 1902, 1903, 1904, 1905 by those three: Carnegie, yeah, Rockefeller, and they and they brought in the uh, Prussian uh, school system uh, to give us the uh, a system that would create followers, you know, good workers for the factories and people who would I, never question authority and all that kind of thing. The, the Prussian system. Yeah, so I had a, uh, going through, this was an oversimplification. The Phoenix phenomena has way more data than this, but but it has enough to fill three published books and 81 videos. But this is the, <laughs> yeah. Like I said, this is an oversimplification. However, you can get the gist here that any two of these events that I just mentioned are 138 years apart. And if you just and if you just use a calculator and count 138 coming all the way up to the future, you will always land on 2040. No matter how, no matter which events you take, you will always land on 2040. So 2040 is the next Phoenix phenomenon day. So what are we to expect? Well, according to the historical record, the Phoenix phenomenon involves the darkening of the sun, the moon turning red, rocks falling from the sky, major earthquakes, and red fallout, like, like blood falling from the sky, which it's called blood, but it could be some, other, some, some type of carbonaceous organic material that's mm -hmm. red rain, red mud, red dust, whatever. So taking these into consideration, what event in the apocalypse texts mirrors that? I, I can tell you real fast. It's the sixth seal of Revelation. Before the apocalypse even begins, seven seals have to be broken because the apocalypse means the unveiling, and it mean and it means that for two different. For, for, I mean, for it means that because it's two different things being unveiled. 
Remember, right. we exist in two different realities. One of them is for the collective. You can scare. Hey, you can be scared. The unveiling for you is going to be a tribulation. The unveiling for you is going to be a cataclysmic reset. It's going to be an episode that's going to be terrifying. If you're a member of the collective, you identify with the collective, and you are not a highly individualized soul vibrating on a on a frequency of love and peace then the unveiling when those seven seals are broken and that seal is open because it takes seven seals to open the scroll. Opening the scroll is the unveiling. This is why the entire book of Revelation has two messages. One is to the redeemed, those who understand the times, what they're going through, and are basically going to be immune from all this. The other is the collective who are going to suffer the very things they fear. This is this is this is a this is an energy based construct and it's going to give you what you expect. So the, in those seven seals, the sixth seal is the one we need to pay attention to because when the sixth seal is broken, the sun turns black as sackcloth of hair, the moon turns to blood, rocks fall from the sky. And the kings and the people of the earth hide in the mountains and the caves caves and it, because the cataclysm is so is so horrific they're trying to hide underground remember since the 1970s what has the united states military industrial complex been doing if you've been dumbs. keeping up with it they've been building dumbs everywhere yep. they've been building underground facilities everywhere to survive not a nuclear war the whole nuclear deal is a psyop it is a scare tactic to to induce you to pay to to agree to more taxes, just right. like NASA. Got to fund psyop. that military industrial complex. Yeah, NASA's a psyop. Yep. Yeah, thirty four billion dollars a year. They only need two percent of that to continually perpetuate the idea that they're actually going back and forth from space when they're not. The other ninety eight percent of that budget is for all the deep state. Oh, sure. funding, all the uh, military underground military all the black ops stuff yeah guys it, it's a it's it, it become even even the hadron collider even these superconductors and colliders and all that it says there's they love that that we get on social media and have all these rumors about what they're doing they're changing reality mandela effect is because of cern and all that cern's not doing anything to well just, you got you got fake X that. out there. I call it fake X, you know, no. as if rocket technology is something that we should even be looking at. It's so ridiculous. You know, it's just yeah. such an insult to, you know, a, a technology that's hundreds of years old and, and they're, you know, parading it out there as if it's something uh, modern and right. <laughs> up to date. I agree. I agree. 100%. So the, uh, the Phoenix phenomenon the next time we will experience that is May 2040. In the entire history of the world, all the chronological records that I've put together, thousands of data points, hundreds of data sets, it's, it's free to the public. I have my Chronicon, every, man, thousands of people have downloaded it. Listen, it's, it's, it's set in stone. We have 16 and a half years. We're still a little over, a little less than 17 years well, till, this, till this occurs. So, but that's still not the, the apocalypse. That's the sixth seal. So if the sixth seal is the Phoenix phenomenon, and we can and we can find all these references to the number 138 in ancient records, and we do. I have another video that gives you all, all every every citation of ancient every culture and every that, that referred to this Phoenix phenomenon number and what it meant to them. So, and it was always resets and cataclysms, mud floods, destruction every single time. So 2040 is set in stone. There's, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to happen. Now, what's going to happen totally depends on the individual, 100%. Because the oversoul will always find a way of escape for those who believe that they're not going to be harmed by it. It's just the way it is. You're going to receive what you expect. So, uh, if it's the sixth seal, then we need to pay attention because we only have like 17 years till May of 2020. 20, uh, 40. So if it's the sixth seal, then we need to pay attention. What does the first seal mean? What is the second seal, the third seal, the fourth seal, and the fifth seal? Because we know starting that are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. But when we read the text, there's actually a fifth horseman there. So what I'm saying is, is 
In 17 years, a whole series of events must unfold before the Phoenix phenomenon happens. So we're in for a wild ride. <laughs> we're in for a wild ride. There's, some, there's some, I, I mean, I can give you, uh, this doesn't have anything to do with the Phoenix phenomenon, but I, I can basically give you a really good idea of the first horseman. First, the first horseman is going to be a, a messiah like figure who is acceptable to two of the three Abrahamic Judaic, you know, type religions, Abrahamic religions, two of the three will accept him. A third will not. And I believe Islam will not. I believe, I believe Judea, you know, you know, the Judeo Christian world will. And this is what's going to start the, the red horseman, which is war. This is an all out Christian religious Christian Muslim war. Now I'm also speaking from the position of having been educated to know this. And what I mean is, is that these in the 1890s, all the way up till the 1920s, the three world wars were already mapped out. And I show on my channel and I cite the sources where, where this can be found in the, in the writings of mafia. I, his name was mafia something. The, the term mafia came from this guy's name, but he was a 33rd degree Mason. He was a crime Lord and uh, uh, mafia M A F I A is actually an acronym in Italian. Uh, and it's where we get the word mafia from today. But this guy wrote a letter to Albert Pike, 33rd degree Mason. And Who put the wars in his book. Yep. Yep. 100%. World war one happened exactly the way they wanted it to happen. It was already predicted because it was because it was staged. World War II did the same thing. So World War III is going to follow suit. And in World War III, it's an all-out war between Christianity and Islam. And every bit of it is staged. And they've already started staging it. This is exactly why all these Western European countries are, ha are having all these Middle, Easter M Middle Easterners imported into their nations. Look at the UK. Look at Ireland. They've got... They're steadily pumping them in. They're getting prepared for, for the enactment of the first and second horsemen. So anyway, that's nothing to do with the Phoenix phenomenon, but that's, that's it's all. crazy stuff though. Yeah. So what you're, I know you've done some predictions in the last couple of years, uh, maybe run through that briefly and then I'll let you go. Cause it, you know, we're, uh, I think we've uh, unloaded quite a bit of information for people to yeah. sort of digest. That's cool. Oh, uh, I think the I think the next big moves right now is this is a huge and I had predicted this two years ago and I have the videos on my channel where I was describing at the height of the socialist liberal power structure in the United States when they were winning all the battles they were winning social media they were editing and censoring everybody when when they when they were doing everything they were doing with the elections at the height of their power while they're all gloating on ABC NBC CBS CNN and while all this was happening, I was predicting that things were about to go the other way, but it's going to take some time. I had predicted that we're about to, we're about to, the pendulum is swinging in the other direction where conservatives are about to take power. They're going to take power fast. And a whole bunch of people in, I said, I said, Hollywood and Washington, D.C., liberals and socialists are going to start taking hits and many people are going to start losing their platforms. This is way before CNN started firing people, way before ABC, NBC, and CBS started losing so and, much. And so the Twitter files and all that. Yeah. It was way before the Twitter files, Elon Musk taking it over. It was way before this major conservative movement in the United States to, to just basically basically do away with all democratic programs and all this stuff is going on. And uh, uh, I made the prediction that, that the conservatism is going to sweep hard because it's a part of the deep state preparations to get America ready to fight another crusade. And in order to do that, they need, they need to trigger Americans to be, to be more religious and they're going to, they're already in full effect right now. Churches are already gaining a massive amount of political power as I as I speak, and it's rising weekly. So the next election, there's not a, there's not a Democrat or a socialist that has a chance. This is going to be election election between two conservative powers in America. Yeah, the Democrats are over, and it was all by design. In my predictions videos, 
Uh, I explained that the next two to three years is a controlled collapse of the Democratic Party. It's all by design. All these news events you see about Biden doing all these dumb things and Kamala Harris doing dumb things, all every single thing, leaving all that military hardware in Afghanistan, every blunder, everything, every bit of treason is they're showing this on the news because it's it, it, this is a controlled collapse of the Democratic Party. Because in order to stage World War III, they need an American population who is morally indignant and ready to stand behind Christianity be, and, and, and basically wage war against Islam. This is this is the next this is the next big event. So one mind box versus another mind box. That's all it is. I mean, they got to understand what I'm talking about is from is is these are the do ongoings and doings of the collective. They're not a part of my world. I don't care either way. I'm I, I live my life day to day teaching people what uh, what they're willing to hear, doing my videos. I live a good life. I'm at peace. Uh, I, I don't care. It's not it's not about fear mongering. Half of my half of my channel is all about hope and, and getting people to understand there's different ways to bring the things in life that you want into contact with you. And there's even formulas to accelerate that. Not only do I teach them, but I practice them and I do them and they unfold in my reality. And my, my listeners see that they see they see that I practice the very things that I that I that I preach. So. In the personal, there's not, there's nothing for any of us to worry about. In the collective, they're about to go through some shit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we'll leave it right there, Jason Brashears. I so appreciate you, and and uh, appreciate you taking the time to share a vast amount of information. I know we've only touched a tiny pinpoint of uh, what you put out there. So I'm going to put the in the description down here. I'm going to put sure. uh, your website your YouTube channel so people can look further because there's just so much information. But this, that was a great in um, overview of, of a lot of these things that, you know, people will make people think. <laughs> anyway, I so appreciate you, Jason. Thank you so much. And I'll end it here and I'll say what I usually say, all of you out there, I hope you're doing great and we'll see you next time inside the matrix.